In Live on Live this Thursday, I'm joined in studio by the managing editor of the Africa Report magazine, Nick Norbrook, for our monthly discussion on the inside stories coming out of Africa. Nick, you're welcome as always. Thanks very much, David. Great to now, be here. Today, we have selected two stories from the latest edition of the Africa Report. Uh, number one, uh, it's your frontline feature, which is uh, entitled NGOs, Blessing or Curse. And the second story that we're going to look at, if we get around to it, is a one-on-one -on -one interview with Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, who is the Emir of Kano in northern Nigeria. Now, Within these two articles, we're spoiled for choice, I have to say. But let's first take a look at NGOs, Blessing or Curse. And that was written by your journalist, uh, Mark Anderson. Now, this article uh, that I have here, Blessing or Curse, it really is addressing the elephant in the room when anybody wants to talk about NGOs, and especially when trying to form a balanced opinion about the role of NGOs currently in Africa. I mean... On the one side, we see NGOs being hammered in Ethiopia, in Egypt, in Zimbabwe, having to register to more restrictions, and similarly in, in Nigeria as well. Um, but on the obverse, you can see places like Kenya, which is now becoming, well, it always has been the de facto, but is now becoming the de jure hub of NGOs across the planet, one could almost say. Give us a little recap of exactly what is at stake here when we're looking into the blessing or curses of NGOs. Well, uh, the way I like to look at it, um, as we're sitting uh, in France's capital today, is just to like to have a little, you know, armchair thought experiment and say, um, imagine it is 1788 and we're all peasants in the south of France and these, you know, high powered, well financed NGOs are, are going around the suburbs of Marseille, handing out blankets and you know, cake mm -hmm. <laughs> and baguettes and inoculating children um, and just just generally taking the edge of what otherwise would be a pretty tough uh, period. We, you know, would we be hearing La Marseillaise be, be, uh, be One be year shouting? later in 1789. Exactly. Would you get a French Revolution? Would you get the, the centuries of enlightenment that followed? This is indeed the crux of this article. It's, it's really kind of looking at the argument that NGOs have hampered what is known as the transmission line that drives progress. And that, of course, is like the popular grassroots pressure that will get national leaders to actually deliver. Instead, as you have just alluded to there, it leads to a handout culture. Well, it, it, it does. It leads to a, a handout culture. But I think more pernicious than that, it sort of insulates these very parasitic elites that, you know, took power in questionable circumstances in the 1960s after the French and the English and eventually the Spanish and the Portuguese left. Out, you, know, yeah. the, these, you know, these regimes that were erected, uh, you know, some of them were great and were immediately knocked out by the CA. Some of them were, you know, less great and have sort of perdured to today. And and they, I, you know, a, a lot of the people who we spoke to, including uh, this uh, academic Firoz Manje, who you know who was himself part of the NGO community, he was, you know, the the former Africa director of Amnesty International, and he says that you know really, you know, we're insulating these regimes from popular pressure by you know, helping fund their education budget, by helping fund the health budget, by helping to do a few roads here and there, we're taking the edge off, you know, what would be getting people serious back, popular anger. Yeah. Getting, getting the actual politicians to do the work themselves, basically exactly. getting responsibility. But also one of the issues that really crops up in this is um, there's the certain, um, the, the, the arrogance, if you will. Well, I wouldn't say arrogance. It's, it's, it's more like you, you have certain NGOs that are putting themselves forward, um, looking uh, to protect marginalised um, members of societies, people who are really the most vulnerable, without really asking the people if they wanted to be, wanted the help or wanted their representation in front of governments. So it's all very kind of trickle down rather than from grassroots up. It's like, oh, well, we're going to stand in like a great white knight. And they're going, well, actually, we have people who are petitioning government at the moment. We could maybe sort it out ourselves. So what he is also saying in, 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 in the article here is that if we start, it's really about it's not that NGOs are bad or good or otherwise, they are a necessity. But we have to start looking at another structure for NGOs and how they are working from the grassroots up rather than the other way down. Absolutely. And, and you know, one of the, you know, another one of the, the criticisms that's, that's uh, sort of, you know, front line in this piece, uh, as it were, is, is this idea that 
some of the uh, international NGOs come with a certain agenda, a certain view about how states should be run. So, um, you know, the former and now defunct prime minister of uh, Ethiopia, Melej Znawi, always said, you know, they, they came with an idea that the state was bloated, it had to be slashed right back. You know, we're in the heady days of the Washington consensus, the 1980s, sure. structural adjustment, the 1990s, more structural adjustment. Um, and a, a lot of them articulated either explicitly or implicitly this idea that, you know, it, the idea was to get to the private sector ASAP, get rid of the state, it has, you know, no role. And and we're, na we're now seeing, really, across the world, you know, especially with the emergence of, uh, you know, the, the Superman in charge in, in China, that, sure. that there are other models which are much more effective in delivering development, which include the state. And, and Ethiopia famously threw out all its NGOs a decade ago, and it's actually not doing too badly. It's doing, not doing too badly. And no. actually, well, it would be one of the East African countries that could attract a lot of the manufacturing uh, industries from Asia into Africa. That's right. And I think a lot of this is about ownership. You know, mm. if, you, if your national elites, you know, feel the pressure from the population for delivering, and if they, you know, have a, a free, I, I don't want to say ideological, but a free kind of view as to what they want to do, mm. they will be much more effective than, you know, a, a parasitic elite propped up by, by aid who aren't really in it for development. And of course, talking about the uh, late Melis uh, he had a point and so far as he knew uh, something that a lot of people did not know. And that was, well, he found out very quickly under the, well, while fighting against the Derg in the 1980s, that aid can be used to topple governments. It's a, sim it's a very, very powerful tool to be able to cut off that supply. But of course, he would be more prone to the self-sufficiency back in the day or getting getting away from the, that uh, crutch that was the post-colonial uh, uh, legacy, one can say. But now, if we're looking at building NGOs, that's restructuring and building NGOs from the from the bottom up, there's a, a very interesting piece about Shack Dwellers International as being really a local-based um, NGO that built up and up and up. However, if you give more power to lo local NGOs, we also have to see these local groups protected from hostile governments. So there's a bit of a catch-22 here. There is certainly, uh, you know, all kinds of catches involved. And, and I guess one of the, 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 the tough things is, you know, th there, are, there are fantastic NGOs which are, are small and grassroots, um, but perhaps lack the ability to scale what they're doing beyond, you know, a, a district. Mm -hmm. So if there was, you know, a way of finding uh, financing mechanisms which helped uplift the, the, the exciting and interesting and worthy NGOs, um, that would be fantastic. We are not saying at the Africa Report that we have cracked this No, oh, no, no, and, absolutely and, and, not. And we, and we do say, for example, in, in Nigeria, there is uh, a very uh, powerful attempt to regulate NGOs, which appears to be more about getting rid of um, annoying people who want to criticise the government than it is about gaining control. Indeed, that's a subsection within uh, within that uh, Frontline article. And I really definitely recommend it to anybody out there for uh, the Africa Report magazine this month, that blessing or curse NGOs. It is really opening the debate there. Um, we have a little time left here. Before we go, there's another great piece in this month's edition, and that's an interview with Sanusi Lemidu Sanusi, who's the Emir of Kano. This guy's a bit of a rock star. Like, Just tell our listeners a little bit about him before we get started. Well, you, you will know him if you've seen him because he sports these uh, pretty incredible robes, uh, which are, you know, partly the traditional garb of the Emir of Kano, but also he's clearly got a great tailor uh, <laughs> as well. Um, uh, but, you know, he beyond the beyond the costume lies uh, a lot a of very, substance, a very sharp mind. I first uh, came across uh, Lamido Sanusi when he was governor of the Bank of Nigeria. And, you know, we were in some quite hot water at the Africa Report because we had been asking questions of these banks, you know, just before he became governor and eventually fired a bunch of CEOs. Um, and, you know, his substantial criticisms of, of uh, the status quo have not really stopped. He, he said, you know, in a, in a 
a letter which was made public that the the regime of good luck Jonathan had stolen you know twenty billion. He plus wasn't scared dollars. to put his head above the parapet Absolutely at all. Absolutely not, and he's doing the same thing as Emir of Kano. His belief mm -hmm. is that the north of Nigeria needs strong leaders. It needs leaders who are literate in Islamic law, and his his whole idea is to is to say you know we need to take ownership of what we think Islam is in Nigeria. We shouldn't be importing ideas from abroad. We have very fine Islamic scholars here in Nigeria, and so they're they're. You know they're rewriting uh, the the family codes there, and and you know it's the it's the kind of leadership that northern Nigeria has not seen in for, long time. for some time. Well, I mean it's an incredible interview with um, Lemidu Sanusi. I mean going from everything to opening up the old trade routes of the Sahel to why is English a language recognised, but you know Arabic isn't. Seeing that the kids when they go into school that's all they can read is Arabic in the northern part of Nigeria. Well, unfortunately, time flies fast when we have the Africa Report here on. Paris Live PM. Nick Norbrook, thank you very much for being on the programme today. Thank you very much. And that's all we have. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. Bye-bye.